Hey everybody, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough, and today I want to talk about a mechanic within the gaming industry that I think is incredibly interesting, and, and one that I have had some experience with where it didn't go well, and others where it really did. And that is, of course, talking about the idea of a sideboard. And not just talking about it in a conceptual way, but I want to show off a game that I've been playing lately that brings that into its core mechanics. For those of you who don't know, a sideboard is essentially if you were to go to a one day event, right? No matter how competitive it is, it could be a very narrative thing, whatever. You have your army list, okay? So let's say it's 2000 point AOS army because that's mostly what I cover here on the channel. And then off to the side, you have maybe 200 points of units that in between games, you can swap them out. So it gives you a little bit of customization into what kind of army you are bringing to each game. If you look across the table and you see something that you have a hard counter against in your sideboard, put that in your main army list. As long as the points add up to be, you know, your 2000 or less, boom, you're good to go. In Magic the Gathering events that have sideboards, you'll have a secondary deck and it's the same principle. You're swapping out cards. It just gives you a little a kind of a bank of options, little extra tools in your toolbox to be able to tackle other challenges that you might meet. And I've seen this actually done before in um, the miniature wargaming space. Uh, definitely the first event that I ever went to, actually when I was just getting into fantasy battles, I was just at a game store uh, called Mox uh, just outside of Seattle, and they were having a fantasy battles tournament, and they actually did have sideboards. They actually had, um, so I think I think it was 10% of whatever the the army size was so yeah if it was 2000 points it would have been like 200 as a sideboard something like that and then um, more frequently i actually played it quite a bit when i was doing war machine and hordes when i first got into you know the the war gaming hobby capital w very beginning there uh war machine and hordes is definitely a game where that was uh, much more I guess welcomed, you know, a lot of those folks because of the nature of synergies and movement and that kind of stuff. They were really appealed to the Magic the Gathering crowd, which love the sideboard. And so uh, I, I played it quite a bit, but it always ran into two issues when it comes to miniature war games doing it. And that is one, space. Okay, these games take up an immense amount of room. We don't rent out huge 5,000 person hotels because we like it. We do it because we can maybe fit a couple hundred tables of 40K and AOS in there. You know what I mean? Like, it just takes an immense amount of space. And when you're talking about certain war games, like Fantasy Battles, you know, 200 points of Skaven Clan Rats is like a second army, it looks like. So where do you put all that? How do you keep track of it? Things get lost, things get stolen, all that kind of stuff. Space is a huge concern. But the second one is game balance. And when I say game balance, what I mean is some factions in the game, no matter what game you're talking about, have a lot of tools in their toolbox, and their main constraint is how many of those tools can I put into a 2,000 point list? Well, if I give you a sideboard, you can take more tools and you can tailor your list to your opponent. Some other factions don't have that depth of a toolbox, meaning I think a good example would be something like Night Haunt. They don't have long range shooting to be able to snipe out a very specific hero, right? They have different options, but none of those options necessarily solve a problem that the faction overall doesn't have. So that's kind of an interesting thought there. So for some people it makes, you know, oh, I'm not that great at the game. Um, having a sideboard is kind of like a set of training wheels to kind of help me be able to do my best all the time. And for those people, that's awesome. That's kind of where I was with fan, um, War Machine and Hordes. I played Signar, uh, it's a heavy shooting faction, and so I, my sideboard was full of just melee dudes if I felt like I needed more of a shield wall or a objective presence. But then there's some armies where like, it just makes the disparity of have and have nots even greater. So where does that leave us with a sideboard? Well, today I wanted to talk about a game that crushes this, okay? It just absolutely nails the idea of a sideboard, the value it brings to a game, and does so in a really unique way. And it does this because it's part of the core game engine. It's not just a bolt-on thing of, hey, you got some extra models, you can bring them in. Uh, this is a core fundamental part of the game, and that is Marvel Crisis Protocol. When you look at a board of Marvel Crisis Protocol, it's easy to be like, Oh yeah, superheroes punching each other in the face, I totally get it. And just assume that it's team split between good and bad guys. It's not that at all. There's actually a lot going on under the hood and sideboards play a huge factor. So if you'll bear with me, I wanna walk you through very, very briefly the army construction process for Marvel Crisis Protocol. If you were to go to an event, you need a few things. To start off, 
you'll need 10 characters. This can be any combination of miniatures. They could be good guys, bad guys. They could go together in the same comic book series or not. And I'll have some closing thoughts on that because I know it seems like a kind of a narrative faux pas, right? To have all these characters that don't belong together kind of smushed together in one list. We'll get there. You also have eight team tactics cards. These are resources you can use. And again, I'll explain those in a second. And six objective cards, uh, three secure and three extraction. That's not really important to know. Basically what it is, is you can choose what one of the two win conditions in the game is. At any given time when you play Marvel Crisis Protocol, there is an extraction and a, what is it, secure. There's two objectives at all times that you and your opponent are kind of like fighting out to get the most victory points with, and you get to choose which ones your faction would be the best at. I know that's a lot of information for those who have not played it. There's a lot of terms I threw around, but bear with me. I'm gonna walk you through what all this means. You look at your opponent's roster, what 10 models they brought, what eight team tactics cards they brought because it's open information and their mission cards to my understanding. And then you build the mission together, okay? So like you, you sort out what's gonna be the extraction, what's gonna be the secure. Once you know what the actual goal of the game is, uh, all of a sudden, then you start building your actual list. That list is built from the 10 characters you brought. However, you're not gonna be using all of them. The remainder act as a sideboard. So what that is, is you have 10 dudes, let's say the point limit, which changes, I'm not gonna go too far into the mechanics, I don't wanna bore you, uh, but let's say you can have five characters there max. You're gonna take five of your 10 and go. If you were playing a slightly different mission with different objectives, it might be in your best interest to choose a different five or something like that. So again, you bring 10, you're only ever gonna use maybe half of them. But that other half is your toolbox that's there to present you with unique abilities and stuff like that, depending on the mission. So like I said, in a sense, you've brought a toolbox and you choose the various tools you need to complete that mission, that specific combination of objectives. So in AOS terms, uh, you'd be bringing 4,000 points of models and building a 2,000 point list to play that specific game. The other models are still in your roster acting as a sideboard, so next game you can choose the best loadout for that. Now, as for the complaints, when I initially heard that there's no restrictions on what characters you can put into your roster, I'm not gonna lie to you, my nose wrinkled up a bit. I was like, that sounds dumb. Like, I'm not gonna have Doc Ock fighting next to Thanos. That, you know what I mean? These like uh, characters, they're all owned by Marvel, but they're all very, very different. They have super different context and scope and that kind of stuff. However, here's the thing. Even though you can technically bring any character in your 10-man roster, you are, uh, I'm gonna say, heavily incentivized to the point of arm stringing you to the point where you bring thematic lists. So uh, much like an AOS, you can take Grand Alliance Chaos and have nothing but blood letters and demonettes and you know, Slanesh and corn. They're not supposed to go together lore-wise, but you can do it. Or you can limit yourself just a bit and take either Heed Knights of Slanesh or Blades of corn. Uh, and you get the faction abilities and all the cool stuff that those things get. Because in Marvel Crisis Protocol, there is this thing called faction affiliations or squad affiliations. What that is, if you have a roster of 10 guys, okay, and you more than half of them are part of a specific squad, and these are like broken up by very thematic things. So it might be like uh, Uncanny X-Men. It'll have all the X-Men characters that are heroes. Then you'll have the Brotherhood of Mutants, which is Magneto and all the evil mutants. I'm trying to keep it to one comic book thing here so it makes more sense to me. Um, essentially, you get faction bonuses for choosing a narrative list. If more than half of your squad, the actual, out of 10 models, the five or so that you chose, if more than half of them are of a single affiliation, you get extra bonuses. And that's how the game really pushes and rewards you for thematic play. Think of these as like narrative groupings uh, that get a benefit when they're the majority of a list. And in that sense, it's just like a Age of Sigmar, right? You, you get extra buffs for playing thematically. Um, those power cards that I mentioned, a lot of those are locked behind squad affiliations. So if you have eight of them at your disposal, you're only gonna bring five to a game. However, some of them will be like, you can use this as long as your squad is uh, Uncanny X-Men. As long as your squad is Brotherhood of Mutants and that kind of stuff. So there are secret bonuses that are very much heavily, heavily influencing you to go down a certain path of like, pick your favorite comic book heroes from a specific series, whether it's Avengers, some of them are big, some of them are small, 
Um, and then you can just kind of follow that path and you get all kinds of benefits for being more and more narratively focused. And so kind of putting it all together, because I'm much better at writing succinctly than I am at speaking, um, it's a sideboard of characters that allows you to pull from them to achieve a specific mission. Um, but also a sideboard of resources that supplement that in a cohesive narrative way. And that's really cool. It's actually a very wonderful system that I've been enjoying quite a bit lately. And I know that this works mostly for Marvel Crisis Protocol because it is so small and limited. It's a skirmish game, right? T carrying 10 characters and using five is not that big of an ask, right? I, I have um, one of those like battle foam tower cases that's like this big. It holds everything for two lists over. But the deal that I'm talking about is the concept of incorporating a sideboard into the core engine. That's what I wanted to touch on. I think that specifically sets the game apart. Like I said, when you go to an event, you're not walking up with your squad of five guys. You have a roster of 10 and different uh, missions and objectives and resources that depending on which, you know, actual characters you choose for your squad, you have different options available to you. It's just wonderful. I plan to cover Marvel Crisis Protocol quite a bit more. It's really taken off in my area and I have been enjoying every game that I've played so far. But I'd love to know your thoughts. First of all, I have a few questions for you. Um, have you ever been to an event in a, in a wargaming sense um, that uses sideboards? Uh, how cumbersome was it? Were there any issues with balance and people trying to cheat and kind of slip a few extra things in the sideboard? That happened twice at War Machine events that I can think of. Um, have you, if you've tried gaming with a sideboard, I want to know your thoughts is really what I'm getting at. But secondly, have you tried MCP, Marvel Crisis Protocol? Let me know your thoughts, and I would love to hear your uh, review of the game and that kind of stuff in the comments down below. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.